I'm a co-founder and head of business uh, at Descartes Labs, so I take a little bit of a different perspective on some of the topics uh, that we presented. And um, Descartes is a machine learning for remote sensing company. This, this pairing of concepts has become uh, increasingly popular. We see a lot written about it. We see a lot of investment going into the space. But I wanted to talk today about a, a paradox from the business perspective that I see of this pairing. So let's start with, first of all, remote sensing. We all know for decades, governments and commercial enterprise has been collecting measurements of our planet. Uh, we estimate the archive of observations to exceed it, um, or to be measured in exabytes. That's 1,000 petabytes. A lot of this data is unstructured and uh, kept in various places, not all obviously in one place. So um, a very large uh, set of data. Now, along comes machine learning. And recently, we all know that machine learning has become pervasively uh, involved in most aspects of life cost of compute and access to compute has enabled this. And we see real efficacy in a lot of the algorithms that machine learning brings to other problems. Um, machine learning is particularly good at looking at very large unstructured data sets and so highly relevant, we think, to remote sensing. And for those that are unfamiliar with machine learning, you can essentially think of it as an inversion of the typical way that uh, a scientific equation would be created. You'd have a plus B equals some Z result in a traditional form. You would feed the input data to A and B and calculate Z. Machine learning takes the opposite approach. We give the algorithm historical Z results and then feed all of the input data to the machine learning algorithm and let it decide the equation. It, in effect, is deciding the rules and bombing your slides. So um, if A plus B equals Z, now we have uh, all of the data starting to come up with a new equation, a, a different equation. Maybe it adds another factor, A, B, C, D, E, and F, and gives different coefficient weights to the different um, variables. Can we get the next slide? There we go. OK. So if you want to tell a computer algorithm to recognize a cat, you can describe in the old way what a cat is and have it try its best. Or and with machine learning, you can give it thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of examples of cats and let it start to build the rules itself. In machine learning, the data builds the algorithm, not the other way around. So this is good news. We've got a ton of data in remote sensing. Now we have a way of making sense of it. This is, uh, this is good. Let's go select all the data that we want, put that in our shopping cart, but we have a problem. In commercial space, the business model is to charge per square kilometer. They've put all the data behind a paywall. So to do the best machine learning, we have uh, this conundrum. When we started our company, uh, a dozen folks in the desert, we didn't have that much money. So we had to think about a different approach. Fortunately, in remote sensing, we have NASA and we have ESA. This is a three terapixel global composite from NASA, from Landsat. We're also able to access the same amount of data from the Sentinel programs, this non-visual spectrum, multimodal data like synthetic aperture radar, and most importantly, the full time histories of all of these data sets. What you're seeing here is a vegetative temporal mosaic over 15 years from MODIS. So you can see the seasons of crop pulse in and out. Now imagine at each location a, a graph of a curve of the inputs as we're measuring photosynthesis from space. We also were able to download all the weather and in effect create what we call a digital twin of the planet. This goes back decades and allows us to do the kind of machine learning like training a cat classifier, but a little bit more sophisticated. So what I'd like to do is offer two um, examples of analytic or derivative work product that we at Descartes have been able to produce by having access to all of this free data, and then hopefully make the argument that we change the model uh, with commercial space. 
So the first one is a crop model. Um, Descartes in 2015 had downloaded all this data and we built a classic machine learning estimate for crop production. We used corn in the United States to begin. What we effectively did was tell our algorithm what the inputs at each county looked like, that photosynthetic curve, including the weather inputs, and by accessing USDA records, we knew how much grain came out of that county each year. And so across all the counties and all the years, our system was able to generalize that relationship of the observed inputs to that output. So that when we come today and we take a, a contemporary collect, we can make a very accurate prediction of how much crop there's gonna be. In fact, our prediction in 2015 was at 99% accuracy. And as these systems get more data, they get better, right? That's the nature of machine learning. So if you're a trader or if you're a supply chain manager, a lender, an insurer, a regulator, a buyer, an input supplier, this factor of how much production is coming is critical for you to know if you know it earlier and more accurately than the market. Let's look at another example. This is a temporal classifier. So on the left, we ask the system to recognize when a bare piece of ground goes in the middle to a, at a second time slice to some man-made structure. That's an event, that's a change detection event. It's pretty cool that it does this, but if we only watched one place, it would be pretty boring. You know, no, no construction today, right? That's, that's kind of silly. The difference, though, is we have all the data. So we can take this classifier and at a regular interval start to watch over entire geographies, China, or even the globe, how much construction start activity is happening uh, each period. And that's an economic heartbeat. That's of value. Um, and so really it's having all of that data to begin our analysis that makes the difference. Now I think the interesting thing is we also have history for these things, so we can measure our accuracy. This one, in fact, when we compare it to government statistics, has an R squared above 0.9. So in both of these cases, we have a series of customers that have a few things that I'd like to observe. One, most of them have never used remote sensor satellite data before. Two, none of them really cared uh, about the raw images, they just care about the results. And three, none of them would have paid per square kilometer up front, but now are willing to pay an amount more than what it would have cost to buy those pixels had we done so commercially. And so this inversion of having a paywall in front of commercial data really inhibits a lot of use cases like this. The other thing that we observe is that typically the most valuable use cases don't uh, exist on top of a single source. It's usually multiple sources that we put together, modus plus the weather. Um, and this fusion uh, is part of the work that we do. We've built a cloud-based, what we call data refinery to bring these different inputs together upon which we can build our analysis. So of course, so far we've just talked about the public sector data sets. Um, we all know in this room that there's a renaissance in commercial space. There'll be more launches uh, by an order of magnitude in the next half decade than in the past. And each of those launches is gonna have an order of magnitude or more density of sensor. So the amount of coverage that's starting to occur is going from sparse to really rich, really saturated. And what that means if you're a supply chain company um, is that what was visible only to you previously is now gonna be visible to your competitors, uh, to your customers, to your suppliers, and that's a scary thing. If you're managing a supply chain and your business was predicated on information asymmetry or information advantage, um, if you haven't paid attention to remote sensing, you're gonna start, because if you're not, your competitor is. But the difference is none of these guys know how to work with remote sensing data, and that's partly technical, but I think it's a huge part in part because of the business model of charging per square kilometer. That's not what these folks want. They want what starts at petabytes and ends up at kilobytes as a data output. They just want to know the answer. 
And so um, these companies, I think, represent a huge new market for our industry, but we have to think uh, both about the technology and the business model. Our experience, though, is if you get it right, the willingness to pay to avoid this disruption is enormous. Thank you.